the European Affairs column in the Washington Post. He lives here in Paris. He has a PhD in French history from Oxford, and he has just published his first book, which is the source of what we're talking about today, The House of Fragile Things, about uh, a group of interlinked Jewish collectors of art in Paris at the end of the 19th century, their families and what happened to them. It's a wonderful book. So Jake, welcome to Pan U. This is your second appearance. You were here a few months ago talking to us about Vichy France, but welcome back. Thank you so much. I hope this puts me on the Pan U tenure track, but waiting to hear, so. No promises, no promises <laughs> and no pay. That's the basis of our university. No, it's okay. great to be here. Thank you for having me. The House of Fragile Things, how did it arise? How did you first encounter these people? So, um, it originally began as my uh, PhD dissertation in Oxford, but the way that I got onto the idea initially um, was, so I, when I was a, let's see, I would have been a sophomore in college. I came to Paris uh, to basically work as a coffee garçon at the now defunct office of the International Herald Tribune. Oh, wow. um, yeah, full Gene Sieber glory, it was not, but what can you do? Um, anyway, so as part of that summer, I, um, I lived upstairs from one of my professors, who is the um, uh, French Revolution expert uh, named Patrice Igonet at, at Harvard. And he, uh, we were, I was at the time very interested in, in Vichy and, and the Second World War, and still am, um, but was sort of just beginning all of that at the time. And he mentioned to me um, at dinner one night that I might visit the Camondo Museum, had I seen it. Had I, had I thought of going there, I should try and make a, make, make a window to, to do it. And um, I, I went several weeks later and was just sort of haunted by the place. Now, um, I'm sure some of our viewers today have seen it. Um, if you have not, it is this, um, on the one hand, sort of exquisite collection of 18th century art objet d'art near the Parc Monceau. But um, it's also the story of a family that was a Jewish family that was decimated by the Holocaust. So, and in a sense, a Jewish family whose story is a microcosm for the story of the Jews in, Fran in modern France in general. So you have the immigrant father who comes from <clears throat> Constantinople in the 1860s, the son who dies fighting for France very proudly in the First World War, and the daughter and the grandchildren who are murdered in Auschwitz um, because of uh, the collaboration with the Germans during the Second World War. So it's the whole horrible story all in one family. And I was just always really taken aback by that. And I kept finding myself returning to it. And when it came time to do the PhD, I just um, really, immerse myself in that archive. And then I discovered that- um, Jake, just to clarify, the museum that you're talking about is the actual family house of this family. Yes, yeah, I should, that's a great question. Yes, um, so it is the house that the, Moïse de Camondo, uh, the, the main sort of patriarch of the family left behind and donated to the state. He was a sort of impassioned collector. And um, when he died, left it to France as a sort of love letter to this adopted country that in his eyes had given so much to the family and that in fact, the family had given so much to itself. So- And it's I still realized, filled, sorry, just to clarify, it's still filled with all the objects that this family collected. Exactly, exactly as they left them too. So it's um, organized, I mean, it's it has this kind of Downton Abbey aspect to it. I mean, it's the collection, but it's also, you can visit the bedrooms and you can see sort of the traces of the people who once lived there as well. Anyway, um, just to make a, a long story, a slightly, a, a, a tad bit longer, um, I discovered that um, sort of the Camondos were intermarried with any number of other families, kind of other elites of the same kind who also collected art uh, with an impassioned vigor in a very fraught moment. Now, this was France of the Dreyfus Affair before the Second World War. Anti-Semitism was a constant uh, part of public discourse, sort of inescapable. And they all collected art. And each of the five families that sort of um, were interconnected and that I write about in the book left a collection or a house or something like that to the state. And I thought to myself, now that's really interesting. Like, what is that all about? what is the meaning of these donations? 
and what um, what are we to make of them? Um, you know, at this point, decades after the Holocaust, like, does it change the meaning of them? In what ways does it change the meaning of them? Um, and that's how I got no, into. They don't. No, they don't. So you they don't, began. Buddy. Sorry, we need to we need to mute everyone. You began investigating, researching these families, all of whom appear in the book. But today we're going to focus on a particular painting, which was the property of one of them. Pamela, maybe you could bring bring up the uh, painting, the stolen Renoir, which is at the heart of today's conversation, and Jake can tell us about it. Yeah. Jake, go ahead. Tell tell us about the Renoir. Yeah. So the the story that I'm going to tell today is, like Simon said, of one single painting that is essentially the. Uh, red thread, if you will, um, that brings the whole book together. Um, this is a, I, I think, very beautiful, but and now kind of quite iconic uh, portrait by Pierre Auguste Renoir of Irene Cayenne d'Anvers. Uh, it was painted in 1880. And Irene Cayenne d'Anvers is the daughter of the eldest daughter of a prominent Jewish banking family in Paris at, in the sort of the fin de siècle period. And this is the family that co-founded the bank that's now called Paribas. They were like Moïse de Camondo, who was later Irene's husband. They were also collectors of the sort of very opulent Ancien Regime style. They were extremely um, uh, Mondain, very um, central to cultural life in Paris at the time. Um, they hosted salons with the likes of Marcel Proust and Paul Bourget, the list goes on. And the painting is, it, it, it's, um, it's interesting because portraits were, how to put it, portraits were a, um, a sort of a right of passage for bourgeois families. And, and I have a lot to say about that. So maybe we could go to the next slide. So this is the real Irene, um, also in profile as a young girl. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because what I try to say in the book, and this, is a, this being the prime example of, is that um, portraits are a means of, how to put it, um, projecting a certain image of power and in a sense of control. And this was often the case um, of the men in the milieu um, with regards to the, to the wives and daughters in their, in their houses. And so um, the, can we have the next slide? So the men would turn the wives and daughters into exactly. kind of pretty things, into collector's objects. Exactly. And so like, this is, this is Irene Candle there. I have, um, there were, I, I found in the archive at one point, uh, a sermon that the chief rabbi of France gave for her grandfather when he died in the kind of late 1880s around this time. And um, essentially in the speech, the rabbi praises, I think his name is Meyer Joseph Candonver, although I, I forget the, the, the details. Um, he praises him for creating, you know, for being loyal to Judaism, for being a steward of the community, but for also for curating, and that's the word he uses, um, a beautiful home in which, as he says, uh, the women were the sort of the ornament of the foyer. Um, uh, and that is, I think, quite telling. It shows you the way in which uh, these, these portraits are meant to sort of celebrate the ideals that the women in the milieu were supposed to sort of adhere to. So they're supposed to be decorative, they're supposed to be embellishments, they're supposed to be um, uh, kind of ornate appendages to the men in their lives. I mean, it's it's not, I mean, uh, the book is about Jewish collectors, but of course that is not distinct to the sort of rarefied Jewish elite. That's very much a sort of late 19th century uh, bourgeois phenomenon. Um, but um, if we could have the PowerPoint back. Um, but what, what, what I wanted to say is that um, these, um, that, that's perfect. Um, so these, uh, or, sorry, uh, just very briefly, the people you're seeing on the screen are the parents of the Ren Candonver uh, conveyed through their own portraits. Um, so on the, on the, that's her mother, Louise Candonver, and her father, Louis Candonver. And this is, you know, th th this is exactly the image of bourgeois power that these portraits were meant to convey. You know, it's very, 
um, very sort of respectable, like the sort of academic style from Bonin and Carolus Durand. And it's exactly against this style that so many of the women in this milieu and particularly in this family rebelled. And I think that that's central to the inner life of this, uh, this Jewish milieu in a moment of crisis, because you know, we talk so much about, and rightly so, the external pressures of anti-Semitism and social censure and criticism, especially during the Dreyfus affair. But the truth was that um, the, the inner world and the traditions that had sustained this community for generations were crumbling at this time. And it was precisely against the ideals conveyed in these portraits that um, many of the women in particular were rejecting. And that begins with Louise Cain d'Anvers, who you can see in this picture. Um, we can have the next slide. Uh, this is Proust, one of her, one of her guests, maybe uh, another one. Yeah, so this is the, the Cain d'Anvers family home. It is the pinnacle of a refurbished 18th century chateau. It's outside Paris. It's called the Chateau champs sur marne It, in, the, in its day, hosted the likes of Voltaire, Chateaubriand, you name it. And um, it's, it's, so it's in these spaces that the families sought to install themselves to prove that they could um, uh, kind of curate Truly they, they were proving also that they could be French, that they weren't just these foreign Jews that the anti-Semites derided them as, who exactly. supposedly right. had no taste. They could curate the best of French historical art. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think what I was trying to say, like connecting to the, um, uh, the previous point about women in the portraits and this family in particular, is that, so you can see here exactly um, the image that they're trying to project in public, right? This is, um, the epitome of the sort of tasteful French salon of the time. I mean, this is the style that was in vogue in the 19th century. It's exactly the, um, the style of all elites in Paris that was the sort of the most cherished, the most valued. And for Jews, on the one hand, it was slightly different than it was for other collectors because part of the very, you know, as I said, very inescapable anti-Semitic discourse of the time was the line that Jews could not know and understand true beauty, and they were somehow aesthetically inadequate or mimetic, like kind of ersatz copies of Frenchmen. And so this is a way of showing that that's not true, that they could know true beauty. But what I was going to say is that at the same time that that's going on externally, internally, a lot of the women in this family in particular and others in their milieu are saying that it's, it's oppressive, it's too much, and were exploring and pushing the boundaries of the way in which they could establish lives for themselves that were not dictated by their fathers or their husbands. And the Cain d'Anvers women, the generations of them, Louise Cain d'Anvers, who had an affair with, um, with, any num with a, a number of, of, of prominent men, including, um, for those of you who have read The Hair with Amber Eyes, uh, Charles Efrussi. And it was in fact Charles Efrussi that gave um, the Cain d'Anvers the recommendation to hire Renoir to do the portrait that we're talking about today. So the portrait of Irene Cain d'Anvers in and of itself is a, um, it's a testament to this sort of internally crumbling milieu already. Um, and I think I'm ready for the next slide. And you know these portraits, as I mentioned, you know, they're meant to sort of celebrate um, uh, sort of feminine beauty and grace. And again, the question, the big question, or one of the questions is, you know, Renoir himself was an avowed anti-Semite. You know, horrible politics, had nothing but sort of hateful things to say about Jews, and yet was dependent on this very milieu of um, of Jewish collectors to. Uh, to, to earn a living at the time. I mean, he had never been paid more money than he was for the portrait of the Cain d'Anvers girls. Then, um, then that was, the, that was the, the biggest sale he ever made. The question then is like, well, are the portraits sort of Jewish in any way? Is there anything noticeably anti-Semitic about the art? And I don't think there is. And this is um, the sort of early template in the genre, the famous Ingra portrait of Betty de Rothschild, which would have been sort of on Renoir's mind as the sort of um, kind of template for this uh, uh, depiction of a sort of wealthy Jewish bourgeois woman. Um, they they find uh, hiring an anti-Semite to paint their portraits? No, I mean, I think, um, 
you know, the way, I mean, the reality was, um, you know, anti-Semitism was so common and so central to public discourse at the time that it was seen as slightly different than we might look at it today. Um, I mean, the K and Denver were guests and hosts of anti-Semites. It was just social life in the French capital. And, you know, for those of you who have read who have read Proust, um, there are plenty of scenes um, precisely to this effect, sort of these, these salons at the time of the Dreyfus affair that saw um, Jewish um, uh, hosts. And of, of course, the great uh, hero of the book is Charles Swan, who is a, a Jewish collector based on many of the real life families in the book. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's not something that they either would have paid much attention to, or um, if they did, they clearly did not um, did not make much of it. Um, but but anyway, so it, I, to move along from the, the 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 portrait thing, so portraits are a kind of sense of gender control and and men projecting power on women in many cases, not all. Um, but then um, this was um, an ideal against many of the women in this milieu rebelled, especially Irene Candonver. And I think we can now return to the PowerPoint. So, yeah, so yeah, tell us about, tell, tell us more about Irene and yeah. her path. So we could go to the next slide maybe. This is her with her sister, I think. No, that's her, those are, these are her two sisters. And, um, this is another Renoir of the- Yeah, so this is the other portrait of the Candonver sisters. And I should mention that the, the young girl in blue is Irene Candonver's sister, Alice, or sorry, Elizabeth Candonver, and she ultimately was murdered in Auschwitz in 1944. And this and portrait hangs today in, in, in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Okay. Um, yeah, but okay, so if we could go to the, um, to yeah. the next slide. Okay, so um, Irene Candonver is this, the daughter of this extremely wealthy family. She is married off to this man who is Moise de Camondo, the collector who then founds later on the Camondo Museum that I was talking about. He is totally different than she is, even though they are both like their, their father, uh, Moise de Camondo was a business partner of Irene's father. Um, so there was that sort of financial um, like partnership between the two. They were two banks, the Candonver Bank and the Camondo Bank. But Aside from that, you, it'd be hard pressed to find two people who had less in common. I mean, the K and Denver were extremely um, assimilated, were very sort of central to cultural life, as I mentioned. The Camondo uh, were, on the one hand, they were Sephardic as opposed to the Candover who were Ashkenazic. They were orthodox, deeply observant, and um, they were not. They had they had just arrived in in France that generation, and so were not as invested yet in- um, They come from Constantinople where they had yes, a big trading empire. Exactly. And they, they were not yet um, as sort of, um, not, not, not quite like Irene's family. And so Moise was also much older than Irene. They were married when he was 31 and she was 19. So she's essentially still not much older than a child. And, you know, it's not clear that anyone had ever asked her what she wanted to do with her life. I mean, almost certainly she had no say in the matter and she's married off to this man that she doesn't really know and doesn't have much in common with. And the marriage is a complete disaster, complete. And just like her own mother who had these sort of affairs, although always uh, secretive, Irene caused a huge scene in the sort of social life of fin de siècle Paris because she ultimately just divorced Moïse de Camondo and converted to Catholicism to marry the new man that she fell in love with, who um, was a, a sort of self-styled Italian aristocrat with whom she, um, she had another daughter. So it was a huge to-do. It was deeply humiliating for Moïse de Camondo. It was a wound that never sort of rehealed. And um, he fought bitterly with Iran for the custody of the two children they had together. One of whom I mentioned is this guy, Nisim de Camondo, who died fighting for France in the First World War. The other is a daughter named Beatrice de Camondo, who later is um, the, the owner of the Renoir portrait of her mother that I mentioned at the beginning. So, so it's this- So initially of, owns the portrait? Like it's, Renoir paints it in what year? In 1881, uh, or sorry, 1880, and then it's in the salon, which was that black and white etching in the PowerPoint. It was this sort of, it was widely sort of heralded as a Renoir masterpiece, even at the time. Um, 
or maybe not a masterpiece, but as he was not sort of quite at that level yet, but I mean, he, it was seen as a, as a very significant piece. But then the Can d'Anvers hated it. And I don't know exactly why. I don't, there are, there are no traces. I mean, perhaps Mr. Can d'Anvers could have known that it was his wife's lover who suggested the artist. Perhaps that could have something to do with it. We don't actually know. Um, but it was never prominently displayed among the family's other portraits. And eventually it becomes the property of Beatrice de Camondo, whose grandmother gives it to her as a wedding present in 1990. Beatrice is Irene's daughter. Yes, exactly. So Irene herself, despite being the, the, the portrait's um, uh, namesake and subject, is never the official owner of it. I mean, it, um, it sort of, yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of strange how that, that happens. But um, anyway, um, she, uh, the portrait ends up in the possession of Beatrice de Camondo eventually. Let, let's just, so let's just sum up. We have Moisha and Irene, they marry. They divorce very early, but they have these two children, Nisim and Beatrice, and Beatrice now has the painting she's been given as her wedding yes. present. Yeah, I realize there are there are so many names and there families. Are many names. So let's so let's just condense and talk about yeah. the Camondo family here. Yeah. And we have so, a picture of their house in Paris. Yeah. I think. Can we go back to the yeah? So this is the Camondo collection. Um, and again, you know, this is um it's worth pointing out that, you know, it's hard to sort of overstate the degree to which people like Moïse de Camondeau were just obsessed with art collecting. And it was, it was essentially his, his vocation and what he did with his time. This is um, his living room that we're looking at. We're yeah, so this is, this is one of yeah. the centerpieces of the house and it, it's designed to accommodate the seven panels, two of which you, or I guess three of which you can see on the on the walls by uh, the painter Huey, and it's it's just it, it's such a testament to the way in which you know every little detail he organized, as did many of these other collectors. And I think, you know, it's interesting for art historians, which I'm not really, but it's super interesting for me because the question is really like, what is really going on with a collection so painstakingly organized? And I think a lot of it is control in an inhospitable and cruel world. So someone like Moïse de Camondo, who had been humiliated by Iran, who had lost his son in World War I, um, withdraws into the comfort of this little uh, world of his own creation, which is the house and the collection, which he rebuilt more or less from scratch. And it's... it's but Jake, you, you, you point out in the book, I think really interestingly, that this is very, is not the, the furniture of the period. This is a pre-revolutionary style of furniture that he's yeah, that's and, and that all the that all the collectors of that time were obsessed by the ancien regime. It is. It's really furniture. important. I mean, it, it's such a. I mean, look, like it's not unusual that in certain um, uh, moments, uh, certain styles are popular. I mean, that's you know, like in the Victorian age, there was a, a mania for the Gothic style, etc. Um, in fin de siècle France, it was the sort of resurrection of the Ancien Regime and the Fête Galante, the sort of idyllic halcyon days before the French Revolution. Um, and that's popularized by the likes of Jules and Edmond Goncourt, and it was the sort of style of the elite, because for the first time, you had these objects that were owned by nobility available for purchase by wealthy consumers, regardless of their background. So owning objects like you can see in the picture was a means of projecting um, an aristocratic pedigree, even if it wasn't quite the truth. But for and, these elite Jewish families in particular, yeah, I was gonna, you say that, yeah, it's a way yeah. for them to show that they're really French. Exactly. So there's there's a lot going on here. I mean, I, on the one hand, you know, for, for Jewish collectors in specific, particularly, it's interesting because you know France is the first country. It's the it's the first country in Europe that emancipates its Jewish population in the French Revolution in 1790, 1791. So, it's the revolution that um, sort of paves the way for families like the ones I have in the book, like the Camondo and the Candelier, to prosper. Um, and yet, when it comes to their own sort of tastes, they preferred the style of the era that was um, essentially hostile. To, to Jews and saw Jews as sort of unwelcome in the national narrative. And what I think part of the, the motive that's going on here is that um, by collecting and essentially curating, like a lot of these pieces that Moïse de Camondeau has in this room and elsewhere are, are 
they're real. And they, some of them even belong to Marie Antoinette herself. By owning pieces of that sort of cultural patrimony, that, that sort of true French history, he's on the one hand proving that Jews um, can very well create um, a durable beauty, um, but also writing Jews into France's what we would call the Roman national or the national novel, showing that, um, that, that French Jews really do belong in that sort of rich and age old story. And I think it's similar for the Cannes d'Anvers who restored the chateau that as I mentioned had played host to some of the greatest names in French history. And the, the, the point was the story ended with the Jewish family that bought it and was invested in its restoration and that had just as much of a right to be there as did any of the other characters from its past. Um, okay, so Moshe de Commando has assembled this astonishing collection in his house, which he doesn't really show to anyone, he never lends out pieces, of Ancien Régime Art. After his son's death in 1917, he kind of withdraws into his collection, he ceases to connect much with the outside world. Mm -hmm. And he's growing old. So yeah. in the 1930s, as death approaches, where do we find him? How, how is he going to leave this collection behind? His son is dead, oh. Beatrice doesn't want it. Exactly. So he, um, like many of the other collectors in this milieu, he arranges to leave the collection to the state as a testimony to his um, uh, fallen son. It's in the name of Nisim de Camondo. Um, and that's, that's philanthropy. That's, you know, on the one hand, um, like with any donor, it's, it's um, making a gift and, and seeking some kind of recognition. But it's also a love letter to his adopted country and to what he calls in his last will and testament, the style that he admires above all others. And I think that, as we were just talking about, there are some political motives there. But it's interesting, like the portrait, the Renoir portrait, um, after Beatrice gets married, she uh, bring she moves into the house with her new husband, who's from one of these other um, kind of very prominent families, and they I don't know I don't really know what happens to the portrait after they um, were married and before they had their own home. But I mean, it seems unlikely that Moise, who hated Irene de Canover more than anyone else probably on the planet, would have allowed it to be. Yeah, his ex-wife, I guess, right, perhaps not surprising. Um, it, it, it's, um, I don't think that he would ever have allowed it to be displayed, but it is He part also of hated his furniture, right? All this old stuff and the whole milieu, she sort of, because she converted to Catholicism right after divorce. Uh, she, she did, but she didn't, Beatrice didn't convert to Catholicism until the 40s. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, she, it wasn't, it wasn't really her taste, the style, um, but Anyway, so the, the, the portrait um, is Beatrice's possession, but Irene, the real life Irene, the subject of the portrait, goes off to have a life of her own, totally away from her community and from her own children. As I mentioned, she kind of leave them, leaves them all behind. And this is a great photo um, to show. I mean, she, this is her with her, uh, the two big kids are the Camondo children. And then there's her new daughter, and she essentially just um, kind of moved on. And we don't really know the degree to which she was present in her first two children's lives, although the evidence does suggest that she was very distant, if not absent. And um, I think for Beatrice, the portrait of her mother was particularly meaningful because it was a it was this sort of souvenir of this great absence in her life, which was, a, which was her mother. I mean, the mother, by all intents and purposes, the real Iran preferred her, her new daughter, who was, who was much more um, like, her, like her mother, who was much more sort of a socialite, was very beautiful, um, kind of on the scene. And Beatrice was always um, quieter. There were, she was, she was, uh, there were reports that she was quite deaf. She was homelier. She just didn't have as much uh, appreciation. And so I think that for her, the painting was, yeah, it was, a, it was just a way of remembering the mother that um, essentially left her behind. Um, and that always stayed with her. Um, and she kept it all, um, all the way through to the, um, the Nazi occupation. Um, so just so to maybe, clarify, this is Irene, who is the girl from the Renoir painting, grown up. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, the, after, the woman who after speak. she had after she had divorced her first husband, converted to Catholicism, and had this new child. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
and again, it's that notion that I was talking about earlier, I mean, the, of communal fracture sort of from within. I mean, we talk a lot about what was happening on the outside, but again, on the inside, there, were, there, was, a, there was a quite significant amount of conversion, of intermarriage, of people leaving the, uh, the sort of tightly knit social fabric that had sustained these families for so long. And Iran was sort of at the center of that and in a way a representative of it. Um, so she, she sort of goes off and does her own thing, but her daughter is sort of always left with this uh, portrait of her. And um, when it came time for the war or, or when the rather, I mean, when the, when the Germans invaded France and France fell in a matter of days, sort of shocking everybody, um, Beatrice and uh, her husband, Leon Reinach. I, again, I realize there are so many names in this and I apologize for that, but Beatrice and her husband um, had given the portrait to the Louvre Museum director as a kind of precautionary measure. And this was something that many other collectors did, Jewish or non-Jewish, just as a means of safekeeping in an uncertain moment. And um, the portrait makes its way to uh, the Chateau Chambord in the middle of uh, France. Many of you have probably seen that. It's that sort of beautiful Renaissance chateau. And um, it's there that the Nazis get their hands on it. And it's seized by that task force called the ERR. And my German is pitiful to non-existence. So I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce that. Um, but it's, it's basically um, Hitler's sort of art squad. Here you can see the Nazis in the Louvre. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Yeah, okay, so this is uh, the Chateau de Chambord with um, the man you see on the, the far end is Jacques Jojard, who um, was in charge of this at the Louvre at the time, kind of safeguarding these pieces. And single-handedly, he preserved so much um, from destruction and spoliation from the Nazis, and he deserves a lot of recognition for that. But anyway, you can get a sense, I, I have these pictures for you so you can see sort of what it looked like. The, the Chateau had tons of stuff from the Louvre, but also from private collections. But as I was saying, it's there that the Nazis get their hands on it. And the, the Iran painting uh, that had belonged to Beatrice uh, uh, eventually passes into the hands of Hermann Goering, you know, one of Hitler's right-hand man, sort of rapaciously greedy um, stealer of Jewish property. And eventually Goering trades the painting for something else. We believe um, he exchanged it for a Florentine Tondo, although I think there are other interpretations, but that's What's the one. What's a Tondo? It's a, it's, a, it's a type of decorative art. Um, huh. But then um, we don't really know if that's, a, it could have been something else, but the documents suggest that it was most likely that. Anyway, um, then what happens next is, um, is, is just, I mean, it's, it's sort of unspeakable. Um, what happens to Beatrice is appalling. Um, she is, um, I don't know. I mean, this is one of the things that I struggle with the most in writing the book. I mean, she had, um, and she, she never really left Paris and she was totally you know, able to bear witness to what was going on. And you know, there was the Veldiv roundup of Parisian Jews in 1942, but none of this sort of caused her to leave town or to try and um, to hide. And why that was remains this an is open- This Beatrice question. that we're looking at here. Yes, I'm sorry. This is, yeah, this is Beatrice de Camelot and her husband, Leon Reinach, or her then ex-husband, Leon Reinach. And Jake, uh, sorry, but these are people with immense wealth who have the yeah. ability, much more than most Jews in France at the time, yes. to escape, to find ways to hide or leave. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I think, um, it was at the time the Nazis arrived, it was an initially, um, it was, there was a lot of debate in the Jewish community about whether or, or about how much danger they would find themselves in. I think people like Beatrice and her husband and her whole world ultimately thought that they were properly French. Um, you know, her, her brother had died fighting for France. Her father had left this amazing collection to the state. And there, I mean, I have this amazing letter written by her husband um, to the sort of occupation authorities saying, you know, how can, how can you do this to us? We have done X, Y, and Z for France. And, you know, we just, this doesn't make any sense. Her what brother had died for France in World War I. Right. And they had donated this art. And also Leon's family had donated all this art. And so had everyone else they were related to. And how could this happen? 
And there was initially, I mean, even among some of the Vichy leader, the Vichy being the collaborationist government, there was a debate about that too, uh, whether it was foreign Jews that would be persecuted or uh, French Jews or both. And there was enough um, sort of internal debate at the time to, I think, allow people like Beatrice to remain in the illusion that she would be somewhat protected. And um, one Were thing- other people in their social milieu kind of fleeing or was there, did a lot of them want to stay? Um, in the immediate world of these intercollected, interconnected families, um, it's sort of, it depends on the cases. It's hard to generalize. Some stayed and some left. But the point is, as Simon says, they had considerable means, much more than others. Um, and whether you went or, or stayed depended on any number of factors, as so many decisions we make in crises always do. So I mean, I, I'm not sure there's any rhyme or reason to it. Um, but one thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, Beatrice, I found at one point in, in doing the book, um, I, I met, I couldn't find really any traces of her, but eventually I met this, this very old man whose own mother had been a friend of Beatrice's in childhood. And when he had me into his apartment, he opened up a slant top desk and gave me these two letters that Beatrice had written his mother. One of which, which I have a picture of, is, um, is written in September, 1942, three months to the day before her arrest. And here it is. And in this letter, it's just amazing to me because this is after all the Parisian Jews had been made to be rounded up and many were deported to first to Drancy, the internment camp outside Paris and then to Auschwitz. It's after the Nazis imposed the yellow star, uh, making all Jews um, wear that in, in, in Paris as they walked around. And you know, none of that really is on Beatrice's mind. What's on her mind is her conversion to Catholicism which initially, you know, I, I, I had known that she had converted, but I had assumed it was, a, as it was for so many others, um, a survival measure, a kind of last ditch attempt to protect herself and her family. But what this letter shows is that she really believed that she would, be, that, 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 that it was a, 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 an earnest and genuine and even zealous conversion. I mean, she really um, believed that uh, she writes here that God and the Virgin would save her still. She believes that all her life she's been kind of on this path to the Catholic Church and she feels so grateful to be there and surely nothing bad can befall her now. And was it, you know, it partly that, because Jake, her, her absent mother had converted to Catholicism, so it was a way to sort of connect with her mom? I mean, it could be. I mean, that's one way of reading it. I don't really know. I mean, I just don't know much about what their relationship was or how much contact they had. Um, but it's an open question. Um, but she seems personally to have found some kind of solace in that. And it's, um, I, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a kind of question mark. And what's so frustrating with these, these kind of historical projects that are based on archives is that ultimately there are only the question marks at some point and you can't do anything about it. It's not a novel. You, know, you can't sort of come up with an explanation, I, although I wish I could. And this, by the way, is one of my favorite photos of Beatrice uh, taken toward the very end. And the opaqueness of the face and the kind of mystery of it, I think corresponds very well to the traces we have of her. She remains a kind of elusive presence. Um, but anyway, I was really captivated by her story. And if, if the book is, is for anyone, it's for her. I feel like she's been really written out of the story and um, has really uh, has really deserved much more than she has she has gotten. So I so tried tell us what, what happened to her? Yeah, so in December on December 5th, 1942, she is arrested with her daughter um, in their big apartment in Neuilly. And for those of you who have been to the Louis Vuitton Foundation in the Bois de Boulogne, um, the new big modern art museum, it's on the street that faces the uh, the park and the museum um, at right on that street, facing the the big beautiful park. Um, and they were arrested there, taken to the um, police uh, station, and then sent to Drancy, which was the Nazi internment camp outside Paris, um, where you were sent before you were deported to Auschwitz. And Beatrice, I mean, what's amazing is that she lasted there for so long for. 15 months in Drancy. And there are testimonies from other survivors who remember her as, as being you know, exceptionally hardworking and also still, even then, convinced that nothing bad would happen to her. 
that it was all going to be fine, that somehow she would be, as she put it, miraculously saved. And it just didn't work out that way. I mean, her husband and her children were involved in the project to build a tunnel out of Drancy, and they were caught and deported to Auschwitz in 1943 in November. But Beatrice is kept until March 1944, and eventually she is deported to Auschwitz um, at that time. And then again, she lasts for 10 months in Auschwitz in the most grueling conditions. Um, and she survives long after all the rest of her family is murdered there until January 1945 when she's killed barely two weeks before the Soviets liberated the camp. And by then, um, it's this weird thing. We don't know exactly how she died because they, the Nazis had stopped the gas chambers at that point, given that the Soviets were approaching. Um, so it's not exactly clear what happened to her. My, my sense is perhaps it was a death march but there are no known traces of that. So it's, it's this horrible end um, to this, this kind of story of a family in France. Um, but the painting is what remains of it. And what happens to the painting is, is, is also just horrible. Yeah, um, and tell, tell us that. Tell us the aftermath of the painting. And meanwhile, we're coming into the last 15 minutes if people can start submitting any questions that they have uh, for Jake. So this is... Um, so after the war, you know, there was all this art stolen from Jewish collectors, and a lot of it has never been recovered, um, but some of it was immediately. And those, those pieces that were, some of them were brought back to France eventually and um, displayed in a museum show in 1946 that was essentially designed to see if any survivors or descendants could, would come and claim it. Would, these, these pieces um, whose real owners had disappeared or their whereabouts were unknown or, or, or whatever. And the Renoir canvas of Irene Candonver was among them. And it, it, it survived the war. I don't know exactly how or where it was at every juncture. It's sort of opaque. Um, but eventually it, um, it's, in the sh it's in the show in Paris. And I should mention, by the way, that one of the women in this picture is Rose Vallon, the legendary um, uh, kind of resistance fighter and um, an art curator who saved a lot of the um, art looted from Jewish collections. But that's a whole parent parenthesis. This, this is a preparation for the show when they're all Yes. Here. Yeah, exactly. And we can go to the next slide. Um, Anyway, Irene Candonver herself um, claims the painting. She gets word that it's there. She survives the war because, as I said, you know, she had converted to Catholicism decades before. She had a new non-Jewish husband, a non-Jewish daughter. She somehow had an Italian passport and somehow convinced them that she was not Jewish, them being the Nazis. So she's still around. She gets the portrait back. Um, and then, you know, she sells it. She, she claims that um, when, it's, when, it's her, uh, when it's her time to argue for it, you know, she writes these impassioned letters saying that it's a charming memory of my childhood. This is you know, my beloved painting. I'd like to have it back. Where is it? And then she gets it. And then shortly thereafter, she sells it to um, a Nazi collaborator. Um, she sells it to this uh, Nazi arms dealer named Emil Burla. Well, I should say, you know, uh, to be perfectly accurate, you know, I, that's how I view his sort of role. I mean, he would probably have said, were he here to defend himself, that he also sold arms to the Allied side. But the truth is, he was greatly enriched by his uh, uh, sales to the Nazi regime and uh, profited immensely from the uh, sale of looted art from Jewish collections on the black market in Paris, which he was forced to give back later in life. So, uh, yeah, anyway. So there's no, so she claimed she, her daughter and her daughter's husband and children had perished in Auschwitz and she goes after her daughter's possessions, one of which was this painting. This is, yes, I mean, read, it's, girl it's just, from the picture. it's a kind of, I mean, for a story that already ends terribly, it's a kind of chilling and devastating coda because what you have is um, someone who manages to survive selling one of the last material traces of a Holocaust victim, her own daughter, to a Nazi collaborator, you know, with the regime that killed her daughter. And I, again, I mean, it's, 
this is one of the questions, of course, when you write history is that, you know, you just, you, you have to avoid judging people based on, you know, standards that we have now based on what they were going through then. It's difficult to say, I, I know all of that. And yet I just personally really struggle with that. I just, I just don't, I mean, it's really, it's really hard to, to square that away. And, you know, especially in the course of doing the, the research for the book, I mean, she, she essentially tried to efface every single trace of Beatrice that she could. Um, at one point, um, Simon and I uh, months ago uh, went on a walk of the this sort of Jewish section of the Mont, uh, Montmartre Cemetery where so many of these families were buried. And we saw the Camondo plot, which I have a picture of somewhere in here. Yeah, Pamela, if you could show that picture, please. And it's, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking because, you know, one of the things I found was that in 1961, two years before Irene dies, she, uh, this is the Camondo mausoleum in the Montmartre Cemetery. Um, two, so Irene, after Beatrice and the rest of them died, in her, even though Moise de Camondo hated her, of course, she was the last sort of surviving member. And she got the, um, I guess, the, the deed to the to mausoleum. And basically, you're supposed to pay a small amount to keep it up every year. And in 1961, two years before she died, she just gave it away to um, a family friend of the Camondo because she had no interest in doing that, um, not for her fallen son and not for her um, daughter or her own two grandchildren, um, all of whom were killed in Auschwitz and whose property this was, whose family this was. And it's, it's sort of like a final act of erasure. And I just, it's really hard to, um, to, to look beyond that. But just to return to, you, to just to just to a point you make in the book, which I think is really worth mentioning, is you know, she she was in hiding herself as a Jew during the war, but she went to the Gestapo and argued the case for her sister to try to yeah. save her sister, but she never tried to save her daughter or her grandchildren. Well, I mean, I, I don't think she did. Um, the thing is the Holocaust is is there are considerable material like traces and archival records, especially on the German side, right? Those were archives that were meticulously kept. And there's no record that Irene ever tried to save Beatrice. Although, I mean, she may have in ways that don't survive. That's entirely possible, but it's just, it's something that we just don't know. And it's, it's devastating, um, especially because Beatrice was paying her a stipend all throughout the war. But just briefly to, um, to finish the story of the painting, um, it becomes this kind of um, cultural talisman. It, it's in the, can we go to the picture of uh, Breathless real quick? Uh, I'll, I'll get it one second. Okay, but, but Breath anyway. Breathless but, is the Jean Godard, uh, Jean -Godard yeah, of course. film. Breathless, you've, you've all seen Breathless. It's one of the great sort of uh, landmarks of French film. Um, it's, it's um, the painting uh, poster of it appears in the film and it's, you know, Gene Seberg, my former intern inspiration, of course, um, is asking her lover, like who is prettier, the girl in the canvas or me? And it's, um, it, it's, it's really quite something because it's, you know, at the time the film came out, the real Irene was still alive, but very few would have known the story of the painting, which became a kind of, a uh, cult symbol. Like it's now on refrigerator magnets, it's on tote bags, it's on museum gift shops all over the world. But it has this sort of very dark, terrible history to it that's that's sort of unknown. And if we go to the next slide just very quickly. And uh, actually the, this is Emil Burla, the guy that owns it or that owned it. And just one, the, the next one after this. Yeah, and so this is um, Irene in the uh, Burla show that was in Paris a few, few uh, years ago. But I mean, what's sort of devastating is that this painting and you know the, this sort of piece of this world that's that's disappeared is sort of forever in this context, and it's the legal property of a former Nazi collaborator. So there's no restitution claim that can be made, and no one really to even restitute it to. So again, it's this kind of terrible end to a terrible story, and I'll, so I'll it's end. Still with in the collection of the yeah. Nazi collaborator. Yes, it's well in the in his art collection, which is in Zurich, the Burla collection. Anyway, um, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have now. Yeah, we had one question about: Did you speak to surviving members of the family? Did you have any cooperation from them at all, or from any of the families that you wrote about? 
Yes, I did. And I was very, very grateful to have that. Um, there are very few left, um, especially on Iran's side, but I benefited tremendously from um, a, uh, one of her, let's see, it would have been one of her great granddaughters who very kindly shared um, some photos of me, especially of Iran in old age and who um, uh, helped me very, that's, that's the one. Um, you can see this is Iran just before she died. So and, this is uh, the girl from the Renoir painting at the end. Yes, this is, this is the girl from the Renoir painting in old age. Um, and it, yeah, it's, um, I, I was very grateful to have that support, but there are very few left. And so it's, 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 you're largely bound by the documents and not so much by interviews in this case. Lastly, I mean, how do we look back on this milieu? It was so vibrant, so wealthy, so important in its time. And now, as you say, it's almost all gone. So what, what kind of function does a book like yours play in terms of memory? Um, you know, that's a really complicated question and one that I certainly struggle with a lot myself. I think um, what I would hope that people take away from this is that, you know, it's so easy to look back at people like Beatrice de Camondo or even her father, Moise de Camondo, all of these people who, um, the, these, these Jewish collectors that left their art to the state and look from the, the, per, the perspective of hindsight, you know, decades after the Holocaust and say, you know, what kind of illusions were you living in? And the truth is, what we have to remember is that they were living in a world that made sense to them and that, that, that was somewhat of a reality at their time. I mean, how it ended was not how it had to end. You know, that the Holocaust was not predetermined. It was not preordained. And these people, um, not so much Beatrice, but some of the previous generation, you know, they lived in a world that, um, that may very well have turned out differently. And the fact that it did not is not their fault. And it does not mean that they were fools. And this sort of embrace of um, these universalist values that they espoused and this sort of sense of belonging that they tried to cultivate is, um, is quite a powerful statement and one that I think we should, we should cherish. Thank you very much, Jake. Stay here because we're going to thank you in the traditional Panyu way in a moment, but I'm gonna pass on to Pamela to wrap 